Hello, everyone. A very good evening. Myself, Dr. Mohan, Secretary of MBA. First of all, uh, apologies for a slightly late start today due to some technical issues. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar, the 25th session of Learn from the Legends, jointly organized by IAP NeoChap, NNF Kerala, and IAP Trishu. Today, we have a real legend in our field of neonatology, Professor Dr. Alan Groves from the University of Texas at Austin, speaking to us on neonatal shock advances in the assessment of fluid responsiveness. Hearty welcome to you, sir. To moderate today's session, we have two eminent neonatologists of our country, Dr. Chandra Kumar from Chennai and Dr. Jai Krishnan Mittal from Jaipur. Welcome, you, sirs. Last but not the least, I welcome all our delegates who have logged in from different parts of the world as usual and made, made our webinar a success. I welcome you all. I request the moderators to take over. So good evening, uh, listeners of Learn From Legends. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Ellen Groves for today's talk. Professor Ellen Groves is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Texas at Austin and an attending neonatologist at Dell Children Medical Center. He received his medical degree from the University of Edinburgh and undertook post-graduation pediatric training from the UK and New Zealand, where he completed a research degree in neonatal echocardiography. His subsequent research has been related to identifying optimum methods to monitor circulatory functions in newborn infants with a particular focus on cardiac MRI and echocardiography. We welcome you, Professor Ellen. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, it's a great pleasure to be part of this webinar organized by NNF Kerala which has been a, a huge success. So here in this uh, uh, webinar, we are going to listen from a legend, Professor Alan Gross, on assessment of fluid responsiveness in shock. All of us know as a clinician, uh, shock in a newborn is one of the complex, you know, perplexing clinical condition as it poses difficulty in assessment as well as gauging appropriate treatment because there are no accepted normal, uh, normal standards in newborns. So all of us know that early diagnosis is the key to successful management of neonatal shock and fluid therapy forms the core component of shock management irrespective of the cause for shock. So all of us have to remember that one size does not fit all and we need to individualize an appropriate treatment for each and every baby. So there are multiple ways by which we can assess whether a baby needs fluid therapy or not. So most of them would, uh, we can go by clinical parameters like weight loss, reduced urine output, serum sodium levels, urine specific gravity or osmolality or signs of dehydration. But all of us have to remember that these manifest manifestations are quite late. And, uh, you know, if we uh, depend on these parameters, we may miss the bus and may not be able to successfully manage shock. So there are a lot of bedside newer parameters which are available, including, you know, plus variability index, IVC collapsibility. Those things can be handy in assessing the need for fluid therapy in management of shock. Incidentally, we also uh, concluded a study looking at uh, the role of usefulness of plus variability index in predicting uh, invasive hypotension. And we found out that PVI more than 23.5 had a good sensitivity of around 95% and 65% of specificity for predicting invasive hypotension. So come, let's all learn from Pro Professor Alan Gross on assessing the fluid responsiveness of shock in neonates. So I hand over the uh, desk to Professor Alan Gross and request all the attendees to post their Q questions only in Q&A box, not in the chat box. It's over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I'm 
very uh, happy to be here. I'm hoping that my uh, screen is now shared. And Chandra, I'm going to get you to nod for me to show me that we are in the right place and you can see my slides. Yeah, it's well visible, Professor. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your help. Sorry, Manoj, I hadn't realized you were still there as well. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you very much for the invite and absolutely apologies for the delayed start. The, the hosts are being very gracious in saying there were technical difficulties. That means that my computer crashed this morning and had to be rebooted, but hopefully we're up and running. And I have my wife's spare computer here as well. As ever, my wife will bail me out if I get into something that I can't get out of myself. Um, so I, your, your introduction has kindly covered two of the really clear take home messages for, for me from this talk. Um, and I'm really delighted to keep pressing those messages. One, our management response to any baby has to be individualized. I'm often asked by uh, colleagues and trainees um, questions looking for a one word answer to what we should do for babies. I talk about which inotropes we should use and when at the end of the talk, I tend to get asked, but at what blood pressure would you start dopamine? And there just isn't an answer to that question. There are, there are too many different variables going on and just using blood pressure is not sufficient to guide our care. And the second point um, that was mentioned was the use of newer bedside metrics, looking at pulse pressure variability or pleth variability or other measures. And while we haven't really got those fully integrated into our neonatal care, I think it's something that we're getting very close to doing. So I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about those today because I, I really do think that's what's next. So um, I do not have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. And for the talk, my objectives are to talk about the importance of fluid resuscitation whenever a newborn has septic shock, to share the structure that I've been using for some years for assessment of low circulation, to define what I think are indications for aggressive rather than cautious fluid resuscitation. A lot of babies need some fluid resuscitation but there are times when I want to get as much fluid in as I can as fast as possible. And there are times when I want to give a, a small amount of fluid and see what happens next. And I really want to highlight, highlight the need for regular reassessments of fluid replacement all through the stabilization of these babies. A, a pattern that I see time and time again is that we give fluid resuscitation in the early phases of shock. And then once we've started pressors, um, we seem to forget to give more fluid, and that doesn't make any sense to me because the fluid losses in the third spacing is ongoing. But for whatever reason, once we're on a, an epi or dopamine or some other drip, we seem to move on and think we've done our fluid resuscitation. So I think it's really important that we keep circling back and reassessing for that and giving more fluids um, when necessary. There's really no possibility that anybody in this call doesn't know the Frank Starling curve. There's no possibility that anybody that's that's taken the time to join in for one of these sessions isn't acutely aware of this, but I'm going to share it anyway, and I'm going to talk about it anyway. That's for two reasons. One, at the bedside, during the resuscitation of a child with septic shock, I really want us to keep this structure in mind. And the second reason is that I think if we are all using the same shared mental model for these discussions, it makes things seem more sensible to our trainees coming through and all other members of the team. Again, this shared mental model makes such a difference whenever we're at the bedside that everybody's moving in the same direction. So here's the Frank Starling curve. You know it well. I'm going to focus on the red line because the red line is purely what happens with more left ventricular end diastolic volume. And as you put more volume into the heart, you get more stroke volume out from the heart really key component. And what we're trying to ensure whenever we fluid resuscitate a baby is that we're pushing the child up this Frank Starling curve as much as we can. Now, in today's talk, we're not going to focus too much on shifting the Frank Starling curve up or down. Maybe we should, but and we can talk about that at the end if that would be helpful. But the black lines are what happens whenever we shift the intrinsic contractility of the heart. If we make the heart more contractile, then the Frank Starling curve gets steeper. 
and that's great. If we make the heart less contractile, and there's a fair amount of evidence that sepsis makes the, ch the child's heart intrinsically less contractile, then we've lost our Frank Starling curve and we're getting less bang for our buck. In terms of what makes this Frank Starling curve happen, um, I was taught when I was at medical school, and I'll acknowledge that was some time ago, that by stretching the heart, one gets more overlap between our actin and myosin filaments, and that there are more binding sites, and because of that, the heart can contract more forcefully. <clears throat> That never sat very well with me as a principal because I was always told that two things. I was always told that with more stretch, the extra contractile force of the heart didn't need any extra energy, but that it was more forceful. And I find it very hard to see how that could happen if there are more contractile portions. Uh, I had assumed that the heart would need to work harder. Um, and the answer for that seems to come from this molecule called Titan. Now, those of you that have been at medical school more recently than I have may be very familiar with Titan, but it, but it was a new thing that I started learning about 10 or, 10 or 12 years ago. Titan is a molecular spring. And if we go back to our standard model of actin and myosin here, we have the actin side here in purple, the myosin here in red. And again, I was taught in the 90s that with more stretch, you got more of these cross lapping points, but I'm not at all sure that's the case. I think it's much more about this molecular spring here, which is anchoring the myosin to the base of the action at the sarcomere line. And because this acts as a spring, of course, a spring is something that genuinely gives you free energy free contractility out of nothing. If I try and jump up and down on the ground, I can get a foot or a foot and a half off the ground. If I do it on a trampoline, I can get six or eight feet off the ground. Without any extra effort, that's what a spring does. So this Titan is truly a molecular spring. It's the largest protein in the body. And as the heart gets more and more stretched, this Titan gets more and more stretched out. And whenever the, valve, the heart is allowed to contract, I, whenever it triggers the start of that contraction and the end of filling, these molecules get very easily forcefully, forcefully sprung back on themselves and you get extra contractile force. So I wanna really think about that, that each time we are giving a baby fluid resuscitation, we're filling up that spring, we're putting that heart on a trampoline and making it, making it work even harder and better than it was before. I should stress that that is the case even if the heart wasn't underfilled in the first place, there are occasional times in a very sick baby where I will consciously try and overload the child's heart with more filling to give you more output, even though I didn't think the heart was underfilled in the first place. If I see a child with resistant pulmonary uh, hypertension, and we've done all of our other things, but we're still cycling down, I will sometimes give that child a fluid bolus just to load this spring up even more and to increase our cardiac output and try and break that, break that cycle. I don't really want to talk about that today. I do want to talk about sepsis because I think it's the, the, one of the commonest presentations that we see. I think for sure it's the commonest hemodynamic emergency that we see on the neonatal unit. So here we are again now with a Frank Starling curve. If you've got a child in red dot there where the heart is slightly underfilled and we give ourselves some extra volume, you've pushed yourself right up there and you've made a massive difference to your stroke volume. Your stroke volume has gone from maybe one mil per kilo to two mils per kilo just with, just with pushing the child up the Frank Starling curve. Again, no extra cardiac oxygen demand in doing that. The spring of the Titan has given you that cardiac output for free. Okay, so let's get on to some of the structures that we have and that we that we use for this and the guidance that is in place for this. The Surviving Sepsis campaign is a very well thought out, very um, rigorous guidance to managing sepsis. And while it's guided for uh, newborns and infants and children, many of the principles hold. And the principles in the initial resuscitation, which is what I mostly want to talk about today, are, are really the same across all of our age groups. They recommend 
uh, treating and resuscitating immediately. In sepsis-induced hyperperfusion, they recommend giving at least 30 mils per kilo of fluid. They recommend additional fluids as required. They recommend further um, hemodynamic assessments over time. They recommend the dynamic over static variables to predict fluid responsiveness where available. And they talk about normalizing lactate. So this is exactly the, the patient-centered tailored approach that you heard about in the introduction to the session. There should not be a protocol that says you are going to give X amount of fluid and then Y amount of inotrope or presser. That is not patient-centric. We all need different things and our babies need different things. But what we can agree, I think, on a protocol is that we should be assessing a set number of variables. We should be guided by those variables and what we give. And of course, we should remember to circle back and reassess our response to each of our interventions to guide us where we go, to guide us where we go next. Whenever people have looked at those approaches um, and tried to employ those kind of methods, there does seem to be a improvement in outcome. This is, I think, a lovely paper from De Oliveira's group um, showing that whenever they use these kinds of early goal-directed interventions in pediatric septic shock, they found that children being resuscitated along this method got much more fluid, 28 mils per kilo as opposed to 5 per kilo. Far more inotropes, 29% versus 8%, more blood products. Blood is key here. Red cells are your oxygen delivery mechanism. So giving more oxygen carrying capacity. Again, even if the hemoglobin isn't that low, maybe you want to give more carrying capacity if your oxygen delivery to the tissues is impaired despite all your other measures. They showed, admittedly, in infants and, and older children, improved renal and neurologic outcome and a huge decrease in mortality. It's very hard to do a trial of this. It's very hard to do a randomized controlled trial of goal-directed versus non-goal-directed care. And I would argue in the NICU population that we should not be in equipoise about that. We should not be in equipoise about whether or not we need to give lots of fluids. We might get asked in the Q&A at the end about the results from the fluid management studies and malaria showing that additional fluid increased mortality rather than decreased. I'm happy to talk about that. I'm not clear that we should draw a line from those data to our data in the newborn, but I'm happy to discuss it. So a slide in red and anybody's talk should be the, the slide that you have to remember. If you forget every other slide in the talk, you have to remember the red slide. If you think a newborn has septic shock, treat them as if they have septic shock. Doesn't sound too challenging, but again, it's something as neonatologists we don't necessarily do. I'm gonna talk about why I think that's the case in just a second, but I really wanna focus on this. Anybody that's trained as an neonatologist in, in most countries that I'm aware of have also trained in general pediatrics. And none of us would be in doubt that if a three week old baby who was born at term came in with an E. coli septicemia, that we would give that child lots of fluid resuscitation. So if we have a child that was born at 25 weeks and is now three weeks old and has E. coli septicemia, I feel we should give that baby aggressive fluid resuscitation. So let's put, a, let's put our structure in place for assessment of the newborn circulation. Uh, again, I don't think any surprise is here. I think these are things that everybody would include. But again, I want to encourage everyone to use this structure and to have this clearly in mind. No surprise that the first thing on the list is the history, but the history is absolutely key, both in the newborn period and in our later ex-prem babies still on the NICU. We need to be aware of what the risk factors are for sepsis and what the signs are for sepsis, temperature instability, emesis, increased rate of desaturations in the delivery time period. Does the mum carry group B strep if you, if you screen for it? Is there prolonged rupture of membranes? Is there maternal pyrexia? Is there anything else that suggests this is sepsis? Because of course, one of the key things that happens in the early stages of sepsis in our babies is that sometimes we're not sure if it is sepsis. And again, that's another reason why we are sometimes slower to resuscitate than we would be otherwise. So take a history and then at your bedside exam, of course, heart rate, saturations, refill, your lactate level and your trend, your urine output and your blood pressure. 
The first four of those are available at any time and all the time. The lactate, there is variability in this. I strongly encourage any NICU that's updating or replacing its blood gas machine to make sure that you can get lactate on there from your same capillary blood gas. It's an incredibly valuable marker and something to trend during your time. The urine output, of course, is key. Again, it's been mentioned in the introduction. Urine output is massively important. But in the early stages of sepsis, as you know, some of our babies, our ex prem babies, get sick so quickly that you haven't had time to see a reduction in your urine output at the time that you need to resuscitate them. And similarly, in a newborn term baby with possible sepsis, a normal term baby is only meant to have one wet diaper in its first 24 hours. So you can't really use that as a marker to say there's inadequate urine output. And then blood pressure. Blood pressure is one of my bugbears. And I am going to talk about the limited value of blood pressure in the newborn circulation. But I want to be very clear again. I am going to be dismissive of blood pressure in the first 24 hours after a baby is born. I think it's a terrible marker. But outside the transitional period, when a baby is more than 24 or 48 hours old, a new drop in their blood pressure is a big red flag. But let's talk about the transitional circulation first. Um, one of my uh, prior colleagues in London, Lydia Tischuk, performed this study in newborn preterm babies in the first 24 hours of life. Uh, in London in the 1990s. She used NEARS to assess cerebral blood flow. She looked at invasively measured mean arterial blood pressure, and she very clearly showed that there is no association between blood pressure and cerebral perfusion in the first 24 hours of life in preterm babies. Um, my cohort of babies in New Zealand back in the early noughts a uh, similar concept, but using SVC flow as a marker of cerebral perfusion. And again, looking at invasively measured mean arterial pressure. We, if anything, found at five hours and at 12 hours of life, there was an inverse association between blood pressure and SVC flow. That's kind of crazy because in the neonatal world, we are absolutely using our arterial systemic blood pressure as a marker of systemic perfusion. We think we are screening for poor systemic perfusion by looking for low blood pressure. But in fact, in the first 24 hours, there is no sign of any of that. And in fact, if anything, the babies with the higher blood pressure have the lower cerebral perfusion in, in our New Zealand cohort. Why is that? Well, of course, pressure equals flow times resistance. And as pressure gets higher, we don't know if that's because there's more flow or more resistance. In most babies and in most adults later on, if you're septic, it's because there's less resistance, but we don't know for sure because we're only measuring one variable. So I think we need to try and bear this in mind for the systemic circulation. I always enjoy pointing out, and John Skinner, my supervisor in, in Auckland, really pushed this home to me, how easily we accept that resistance is the primary driver of pressure in the pulmonary circulation. We have this entirely nonsensical paradox as neonatologists, that if we see high pulmonary pressure, we find it very easy to say, ah, ha, there is high pulmonary resistance, therefore there must be low pulmonary flow. But if we see systemic blood pressure being high, we go, hooray, there is high uh, systemic flow, the circulation must be okay. These circuits are just plumbing, the same rules apply to both. So there's no reason why high pressure would mean one thing in one circuit and another thing in another circuit. Of course, it's just that we're used to seeing pulmonary hypertension and making that assumption. So I think I only have two red slides uh, in my entire talk. So the second red slide is outside the transitional period, outside the first 24 hours, new low blood pressure is a very worrying sign. So I'm dismissive of blood pressure in the first 24 hours. I think it tells us as much about systemic vascular resistance as it tells us about flow. Outside the newborn period, outside 24 hours, a baby that has previously had normal blood pressure, who now has low blood pressure, that is a child who has septic shock until proven otherwise and needs aggressive hemodynamic support until proven otherwise. 
Okay, so let's go back to our assessment of newborn circulation. And we're only now going to talk about kids where we are concerned for septic shock. We've agreed we're going to take the history. We're going to look at the heart rate, saturations, refill, the lactate and its trend, the urine output and the blood pressure. And then I think at the bedside, the modality that is most ready for us and most clear cut that we can um, get some input on this is echocardiography. And I think that many centers now are using some aspects of point of care ultrasonography. There are many great resources for training in this online and, and in person. And the technology for this is getting more and more accessible. The handheld uh, Lumify device that we are currently uh, using in the NICU at Austin, or we're just waiting for it to arrive actually, um, costs between $3,000 and $4,000. I'm not saying that's cheap, that's quite a lot of money, but it's not the $60,000 that one would pay for a laptop machine, and it's not the $250,000 that one would pay for a full echo machine. Um, there are some other devices around. The GEV scan is pretty good. Again, about $5,000. The handheld butterfly is pretty good. I find it a bit too heavy. Um, but it, the imaging is excellent. So handheld devices, readily accessible and within the price points of, of many, if not all healthcare resources. So if we are doing echo, what are we looking for? I think we're looking at all five of these metrics. And I do think we should look at all of these metrics in every baby, every time. One of the biggest problems with using ECHO was that any one metric has got a lot of variability associated to it. You always read about ECHO being very user dependent. It is very user dependent. That's okay. To take out any weaknesses from said user dependency, if you make multiple measures of multiple different parameters, and if they're all telling you the same thing, it's much easier to believe that the same thing is happening. So let's look at an example of that. So here on the left is a baby where I feel clear that this baby's heart was underfilled. This is a baby that I cared for some years ago. So the images aren't as clear as they might be, but I keep using this case because it brings up a few really interesting points for me. So this is a midline sagittal view. So if I can pretend that my phone is my uh, ultrasound transducer at this point, I am imaging the middle of the uh, the middle of the chest up and down. So I didn't think that my phone was the same color as my scrubs. So you really can't see that at all. Let me use my cup of coffee as my ultrasound transducer. I'm going to put that in the midline of my chest here and put it up and down. And of course, right in the center of my chest here is my inferior vena cava. So this is my liver. Well, this is the baby's liver. This is the IVC and this is the child's heart. This child is on the oscillator, as you can see from the, from the motion, but that shouldn't make your IVC look underfilled. And here, the IVC down here is at some points completely collapsed and certainly not widely open. This is a term newborn baby who was on the oscillator for PPHN and was on hydrocortisone and dopamine and epinephrine, if I remember correctly. This is the same baby 40 minutes later. And of course, we've taken the child off the oscillator, but I think I can persuade you now that your IVC is much more widely patent here. Again, liver is here, heart is over to the right over here. So heart is over here. And now we can see that this is a much more healthy looking filled IVC. The only difference between these two things is that we've given 40 mils per kilo of normal saline. We gave 20 mils per kilo straight in as we saw these images come up. And we gave another 20 mils over the 30 minutes after that. And then I rescanned 40, 40 minutes afterwards. And I'm not an equipoise that this child's circulation was in better status after that fluid than it was before. It is probably reasonable to use uh, an M mode cut across your inferior vena cava to look at the level of collapsibility. So here is our IVC widely patent at point A. Here is our IVC quite closed at point B. And it's not unreasonable to measure that collapsibility. I have to be honest, in the acute situation, I don't generally spend much time making actual measures from the ultrasound scans because 
you normally haven't got that kind of time. You normally want to get going with your resuscitation, not placing cursors and doing calculations. But you can see here that this IVC collapses by roughly half, 0.74 rather than 1.35. And that's a pretty good sign that you've got inadequate uh, preload in place. Now we do need to talk about IVC filling and oscillation because if you are on a high vent setting, if you've got a strongly positive intrathoracic pressure, then that will tampen add some of your IVC and SVC return and stop that blood getting back into your heart. So it's possible on a baby who's on a high vent setting, especially on the oscillator, because that pressure is there constantly, to appear to have a well-filled IVC, but the IVC can be well-filled not because the circulation is well-filled, but because the blood in the IVC can't make it back into the heart because the intrathoracic pressure is so high. So I don't think one should look just at the IVC. I think one has to look at intracardiac filling too. Here is the same baby that I've talked about from the IVC images. You can see that I'm trying to sweep up from a subcostal view here. So here I am with my probe underneath my zifisternum, shooting up towards the heart and the, and the liver. And I'm sweeping through here trying to show you the right atrium, but I just can't open up the right atrium, not because I don't know how to scan, though some cardiologists would argue that I don't know how to scan, but I think I can find a right atrium generally. This right atrium is just closed because there's no blood in it. This child just has no circulating volume. The right ventricle is also underfilled. The left atrium is underfilled. The left ventricle is underfilled. And have a look at the jumpiness of this valve. I know it's somewhat subjective, but I, I'd still want to plant that subjective model in your mind. If you see a very jumpy heart like that, it means there's a very short ejection time. And I'm going to show you those things in just a second as well. But when you see the heart jumping like that, flitting open and closed, that's a red flag. Again, same baby 40 minutes later. Everybody's feeling much more relaxed. The right atrium and right ventricle are nice and full. The left atrium and left ventricle are nice and full. And the jumpiness is gone. Your ejection time is much, is much longer. So again, this is, this is good news. The heart is more filled. Of course, the reason why we want the heart to be filled is to augment the cardiac output. So having measured your IVC, uh, having looked at your IVC and looked for collapsibility and looked at your intracardiac filling, I think we want to look at our cardiac output. One can do left ventricular output and right ventricular output. I think ideally we would do both. This again is the same baby with the underfilled heart. I've done a subcostal view here. I've got my probe on the right ventricular outflow tract and I can see two things on my Doppler trace. One, I can see the maximum velocity is only around 50 centimeters per second. And two, I can look at how narrow my ejection window is here. Again, this is a very short ejection time. Same baby, 40 minutes later, nice wide ejection time and our velocity is up to 70 or 80 centimeters per second. I feel really clear this baby's cardiac output has doubled with giving 40 mils per kilo of normal saline. Again, in a baby who was already on the oscillator, who was already on two inotropes or oppressors, and if I remember correctly, was already on nitric oxide. So we can't forget to go back and circle back and make our output measures. I'd love to talk about SVC flow, and I'm going to try and hope that somebody asks me about it in the QA afterwards, but it's too long a topic to cover in this. Um, our SVC flow is something that we keep trying to use as a marker of pure systemic perfusion. I think it will turn out to be something that's very valuable for us. We've been proposing a method to make it even more valuable than it was before. The original methods that, that Martin Klukow and Nick Evans suggested are are absolutely wonderful for me. It's a fantastic measure in principle. It's just quite hard to measure accurately. Uh, and we've been working and some other units have been working on trying to make those measures more robust. I have to be honest, I don't generally at the bedside attempt to quantify SVC flow, despite being somebody that's been working on SVC flow for 20 years.
I also don't quantify ejection time, but I want to just share the concept with you because you at least may want to be considering it. And if you want to be doing any research in this area, I think this Tay index or myocardial performance index, which is really just a marker of ejection time is very valuable. What we are doing is looking at any part of the heart, and you can do this on regular Doppler or on tissue Doppler. I really don't mind. Your ENA waves, you'll remember, are from ventricular filling. Your ejection time here is from ventricular emptying. And what we hope is that much of this time period between your filling is ejection time. But the longer you have a an isovolemic contraction time or an isovolemic relaxation time, i.e. the heart is trying to squeeze or relax but not doing anything, the lower your filling volume is. So once we see these very long isovolemic times and a very short ejection time, it's very clear that the child's cardiac function is, is very diminished. Again, I don't put these measures on. It's hard to get really precise measurements of this, but that very jumpy cardiac status and, and the very short ejection time is a pretty good metric for this. So we've taken a history. We've looked at our heart rate and our refill time and our lactate and our urine output and our blood pressure and at least three different echo metrics, IVC filling, cardiac filling and cardiac output. For me, that's what I do at present. I have to be honest about that, that those are the measures that I act on and measure and look at. But I'm starting and many other places are starting to put more and more input on these uh, other bedside measures. So the static measures, heart rate, CVP, cardiac output, for example, we think have less predictive value than dynamic measures. And each of those dynamic measures are talking about how any of those things change with point in the respiratory cycle. This paper by Gan et al. is a systemic review, a systemic review of how one predicts fluid responsiveness in children. Again, I have to be really clear, this is data from children, not data from newborns. And I'm not pretending that newborns are just smaller adults. We're not gonna fall into that trap, but I'm trying to share the data that we have rather than focusing on the data that we don't have. This group did a wonderful systematic review, looking at all the different papers, looking at the predictive value of different variables on poor preload, low preload. And the metric that they used for the robustness of each um, measure was the area under the ROC curve. And I don't wanna to go too stat nerd on you. Many of you will know about ROC curves already, but for those that don't, an ROC curve is a way of measuring how well a, blood, a test performs for predicting an outcome based on the sensitivity and specificity. And a perfect test will have 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, and the area under that ROC curve will be 1.0. So a perfect test is 1.0. Similarly, a totally imperfect test, one that is no better than flipping a coin or rolling a dice, uh, has an area under the curve of 0.5. So 0.5 is worthless. And it's interesting to me that whenever you look at these metrics of predicting preload in children with sepsis and children with um, concerns about preload, these areas under the ROC curve are shockingly close to 0.5. Heart rate, comes out with an area under the RC curve of between 0.55 and 0.65. It's a very little predictive value. CVP, very close to 0.5 again, very, very little um, overall value. Same for measures of left ventricular end diastolic area, same uh, for many different metrics here, the corrected flow time, for example, but the stroke volume index is the only thing that looks relatively promising on here. If you've got a high stroke volume, you're probably better. If you've got a low stroke volume, you're probably worse. Of course, that's what we just talked about in our last slide. You're looking at cardiac output as one of your three key echo metrics of requiring fluid resuscitation. But let's look at these dynamic variables. These are much more fun and much more interesting to me um, we talked or we were, I was trained at least again, and 
medical school about pulses paradoxes, the, the pattern that your pulse changes between inspiration and expiration. In fact, there's no paradox at all. It's a terrible bit of nomenclature. All we're saying is that on expiration, you tend to have a reduction in your arterial pressure. And on inspiration, you tend to have an increase in your arterial bl blood pressure. Now, when we look at some of these dynamic variables, then we break this down, not just to the overall arterial pressure, but we often look at the pulse pressure, i.e. the difference between the systolic and the diastolic in expiration, and the difference between the systolic and diastolic in inspiration. So we've got two slightly overlapping concepts there, and it can be a little bit hard if you haven't thought about these before, take a second to just be sure that we know what we're looking at. We're talking both about differences between expiration and inspiration and between peak and minimum pressure. So the pulse pressure, as you know, the difference between systolic and diastolic. And you can see here on this, uh, on this cartoon that not only does the pressure change between expiration and inspiration, but the pulse pressure, the difference between the upper and the lower changes. So we have therefore done looking at pulse pressure variability, systolic pressure variability, just looking at the top measure, and stroke volume variability. And you can see just running down this chart that not all of them perform well. And in the neuro OR, maybe that's not so relevant to us. I don't know. But many of these measures, your pulse pressure variability, and in particular, stroke volume variability, these numbers are starting to get much more uh, above 0.5, nothing close to one, of course, but definitely performing better than our static measures. There's one key caveat that I do lose sleep over with these, and that's the way in which we are ventilating our babies. Because these metrics have been mostly proven in bigger children or in adults who are on uh, mechanical ventilation. And in many of those cases, they are not on triggered modes of mechanical ventilation. They're under anesthesia or they're extremely sedated or they're extremely sick and they have no spontaneous respirations. In the NICU, the vast majority of patients that I look after, certainly you can make up your own mind for your own population. The vast majority of the patients that I look after are on triggered ventilation modes and the babies are making some attempts at their own ventilation. Well, if you've, got, if you've got spontaneous inspiration and expiration, this curve is reversed. You get more blood pressure on inspiration and less on expiration. The variability would still hold. But the problem, I think, is that many of our babies are on triggered modes where they make some intrinsic attempt at ventilation, and then the ventilator kicks in. And I think that can just cloud what we see a little bit with those dynamic variables. I know that some of the facilitators and some of the um, uh, participants in the call will know more about this than I do. And I'm delighted for them to share their experience and their wisdom about this in the discussion, because I, I will absolutely admit that at the minute I look at the blood pressure waveforms on the screen, and if it's very variable, that concerns me, but I haven't yet got to the point of embedding this fully in my assessment algorithm. Here's the last set of dynamic variables that I want to talk about. And I've left these to the end because I think these are the best. And you'll see again, a lot of these are echo and Doppler variables. So again, without necessarily measuring these at the time of the ultrasound, I'm always looking for these at the time of the ultrasound. Because if I see a big variability in our peak velocity or in our velocity time integral, or as we've said in our IVC diameter, these red box variables are much more predictive. And I think those are extremely helpful for me. We can get the same from our pulse ox pleth measure, and we can get some pleth variability index measures. Those are looking quite promising. Um, I don't think we do passive leg raises on the, on the NICU, and I'm not suggesting that we do. I don't think many of our babies have got massive stores of, of fluid in their legs. I might be wrong about that. Um, but I, I suspect the disturbance of the baby from raising the legs would give you more change in their metrics than from the uh, preload change. So at the minute, at least for me, that's the, that's the key range of metrics that we use. 
and we then have to put those into a decision-making tree. And what I choose to do for that then is to decide whether I want to be cautious with my fluid resuscitation or aggressive with my fluid resuscitation. For me, cautious means I'm gonna give 10 mils per kilo and then I'm gonna reassess. And that is the case in any newborn preterm baby where I think they probably often don't need much extra fluid. If there isn't a history of sepsis, if their blood pressure is marginal but not very low, if their lactate is not that high and in the newborn period in particular, if it's high but improving, and if their filling and function and ultrasound looks decent. I don't want to give them 40 per kilo of fluid. I want to give them 10 per kilo of fluid and circle back and reassess 30 to 60 minutes later. For aggressive fluid resuscitation, and I do mean aggressive, um, I am particularly focused on the ex preterm baby that is compelling cells of sepsis, who is tachycardic, has new hypotension, prolonged capillary refill, an elevated lactate, a decreased urine output, a narrower collapsing IBC, a poor cardiac output, a short ejection time. These are babies where I believe we want to manage those babies as if they were an older child with septic shock. And that means fluid and then more fluid and then more fluid. So I currently manage those babies with this aggressive fluid resuscitation. I will ask a member of the team to pass me a syringe for a one kilo, you know, this is normally a, a 600 gram to one kilo x prem baby that's got NEC or sepsis at a few weeks of age. And I ask the team member to pass me the syringe with the first 20 mils per kilo in it. And I just push it straight in. I might be wrong to do that. And I apologize if people think that's a terrible idea. I think it's the right thing to do because I do not believe I'm going to cause IVH in those kids by rapidly uh, changing their preload and cardiac output. I'm trying to normalize it, not make it excessive. I will then normally ask for the next 20 mils per kilo to be given over the next 30 to 60 minutes. And then I will plan to reassess at the end of that. And while I'm doing that, I will normally request or put in an order that Ringer's lactate be available for any future fluid boluses. So saline 20 per kilo, saline 20 per kilo, Ringer's 20 per kilo ready to go, but not necessarily given, but very lightly given if all of those concerning factors were there. I want to talk about ringers for a second. I hope many of you will be using something other than normal saline for your extensive resuscitations. But in case you aren't, I carry this slide around for sharing it with my uh, trainees and colleagues. This is a very brief summary of the Stuart Strong Iron Hypothesis. I think many of us still think of our acid and alkali being based on the Henderson Hasselbeck, H2O and, and CO2. But in fact, we need to remember that the strong ions play a key role here. The strong ion hypothesis says if you've got a positively charged ion, a cation, it has to be with an anion. It can't be on its own. You need a dance partner for each of these things. And the difference of what we are normally giving with normal saline resuscitation is that we are very rapidly going to give too much chloride. The normal chloride is about 100. If we resuscitate fluids with sodium and chloride in equal measure as the chloride climbs, it can only squeeze out this bicarbonate. And by squeezing out bicarbonate, you cause acidosis. We talk about this as being a contraction alkalosis. I think that's a total misnomer. I don't think there's any contraction about this with diuretics or anywhere else. I think it's just about bicarb loss. And if we're giving a fluid, therefore, that doesn't have, a, doesn't have enough bicarb in it or enough acetate in it, we're going to cause acidosis. So once you're extensively fluid resuscitating, please, please, please use Ringer's lactate or something else with less chloride in it. Next steps simultaneously are outside the scope of this talk. Uh, but again, if I'm getting to the point where I'm giving 40 or 60 mils per kilo, I can pretty much guarantee you that I'm asking for a presser for some hydrocortisone and some packed cells all at the same time. And then I'm circling back and going back to exactly the same factors each time. I'm making my new assessment of do I want ongoing aggressive fluid resuscitation or is it time to ease back? The fluid requirement for these babies is often massive. It's not at all unusual to give 100 mils per kilo of fluid resuscitation to these babies in the first six hours of an episode of sepsis. 
I know that that, that makes people concerned. I know that that causes edema. But my point is, is that if you don't cause edema and the kidneys stop working or the baby dies, you nothing else you can do about that. Saline and all of our crystalloids spend very little time in the circulation. Here's a graph of plasma volume expansion by mills over time. And realistically, with your best intent, any clear fluid that you give normalizes out over two to three hours to be distributed through the entire baby. That's all we can do. I can't fix that other than giving packed cells as volume of support, and we're going to give packed cells. But otherwise, your only alternative to the baby not being edematous is the baby dying. So I'm going to make the baby a Demetis. Newer approaches, again, I think these are what's coming next. The heart rate variability for sepsis prediction looks at bradycardias and apneic episodes and the frequency and depth of those. Very interesting data. Clearly predicts sepsis, clearly predicts mortality from sepsis. Currently very expensive. Uh, lots more algorithms under development. The mixed venous saturation and NEARS Again, I have not been in a unit per personally where those are in widespread use. CVP monitoring is clearly free data for us. If a child has a UVC in place, I would like to know what the pressure is within the chest, but the, what, the normal range is very wide. The ICON, the bioimpedance measures for me are a little bit insecure, but the variability in those measures of respiration might be quite robust. And similarly, the arterial pulse culture analysis coming along, lots of people working on those bedside measures. Personally, I haven't worked in a unit where we feel it's adequate to be used day to day just yet, but it's not far off. I've gone a little bit over time because I always do. I can only apologize for that. I'm going to leave the references slide up. Um, and of course, this talk is videoed, um, but I would be delighted to talk about any of those issues or any other issues that the participants want to do. Many thanks. So thank you, uh, Professor Ellen Groves. It was a very candid and nice talk. And uh, we have a few questions from our listeners. So should I take them one by one, if you're comfortable with that? I'm fine with anything. Okay. <laughs> so the first question is uh, by an anonymous attendee. Okay. So what should be the fluid of choice in newborn in shock with severe anemia? Uh, whether it should be a packed RBC or whole blood, which one should be used if, if a baby is having shock with severe anemia in case of history of cold avulsion during delivery? Okay. So that's the first question. I guess, so I think my pragmatic answer to that is that I, I don't have a mechanism for getting whole blood available rapidly. I have a mechanism for getting saline rapidly and for getting uh, packed red cells. And if you really think the baby's lost a lot of whole blood, then of course you need to give something with some clotting factors in it. So that can be FFP or cryo. But personally, I would be get for fluid volume resuscitation I would be giving saline because I can get it fastest and pack red cells as soon as I can get them there. I encourage every unit to have availability of emergent O negative blood that is there that can be given to, to any baby so long as you have the resources to do that. Uh, saline and blood and saline and pack cells in equal measure. Yeah. So in the emergency, when the baby is in shock, probably saline will do as good as. Um, uh, the blood, and then you can give okay. red cell. So the, the saline will, will increase your cardiac output, yeah. um, but it will, of course, dilute your, your hematocrit and end up reducing your oxygen delivery. So I suggest that you give your first 20 and then 40 per kilo of normal saline, and as that's going in, you're asking for your emergent blood and that you follow that with 20 mils per kilo of packed cells. Yeah. Thank you. So the next, the next question be. Uh, in some scenario when we can't have an invasive blood pressure monitoring system uh, because of difficulty in putting the arterial line or unavailability of arterial uh, blood pressure monitor, can we use non-invasive blood pressure monitor to guide our therapy in neonatal shock? So in theory, you can, um, but the variability in those non-invasive blood pressures, you know, is very wide. And you know that if you stand at the bedside and press 
repeat on your blood pressure cuff that you get some numbers that you like and some numbers that you don't like. And I normally ask them to stop measuring when I've got a number that I like, but that's not a great way to do it. We know that the test retest repeatability of a cuff blood pressure in a preterm baby, the mean blood pressure can change by 10 or even 20 millimeters of mercury. And we also know that in a population as a whole, our cuff blood, blood pressures overread compared to our invasive blood pressures. So yes, it's better than nothing, but be wary of being uh, misled by a cuff blood pressure. If it doesn't fit with all your other metrics, ignore the blood pressure and go with your other metrics. Yeah, thank you. And as you have already emphasized that even with the invasive blood pressure also, there are certain limitations. So we need to see them in in a totality with other parameters like like the if if there was a if there was a single measure that predicted what we need to do we would all be out of a job we would my, my seven-year-old daughter could do this management if there was only one number to measure and she and she knew what to do with it then none of us would have training and none of us would have pay there are multiple things to measure all with their strengths and weaknesses our job is to put all of those things together and come up with an intelligent plan on what we should do and then reassess to see whether we pick the right plan. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question is, can I get the latest guideline for management of neonatal shock? So I, so I, would so direct, I think the best to do for that is the Surviving Sepsis campaign. That's a 2016 document. Um, it's... Uh, is it visible on my screen again or not? I'm not sure. No, it's not visible. You need to share your screen. Okay. Uh, so it's the the um, the Rhodes uh, Critical Care Medicine 2017. And is my screen not visible? I'm sorry. I thought it still was. It's Roads, R H O D E S, pretty clear, March 2017. I'll type that into the Q and A. Yeah, so that surviving sepsis uh, campaign, the management Correct. of shock is is um, um, and well for newborn babies or neonatal shock as well. Uh, absolutely. The I actually, to be honest, I actually find the point of care slightly more helpful for our extremely low birth weight babies. They because they're so uh, unstable, they seem to show extreme versions of our changes of really, really poor filling, really poor function. So I use this absolutely just as much for our extremely low birth weight infants as with our term infants. As ever, there's a caveat on that. If a baby has had a PDA for a long time, the patent ducts arteriosus shunt into the lungs will make the both sides of the heart look very full um, because it increases your preload and it can make it confusing that if a child has been having a PDA and is now shocked, their preload will look normal compared to another newborn baby, but will be low compared to their baseline. So their IVC filling and cardiac filling is not necessarily obvious that it's that it's down. But if you see that their PDA is there, you might want to assume that it should have been higher. And of course, their metrics of LVO and RVO are also much higher in the presence of a PDA. So a normal cardiac output in a baby with a PDA is probably a subnormal for that baby and an indicator for aggressive fluid resuscitation. Look, okay. Chandra Kumar, you have some questions with you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there is a question. Uh, um, some kids of severe PPHN are normal. Uh, I mean, uh, I think he means that uh, even though ECHO shows features of severe PPHN, clinically they may not uh, uh, be sick. Is it due to blood flow, which is independent of blood pressure, as evidenced from your slide? I'm sorry, could you, you, could you repeat that for me? I didn't quite, I missed little bits of that. So some babies with severe PPHN, clinically they may look stable despite echographic evidence of severe pulmonary, a persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn. Is it due to the blood flow, pulmonary blood flow being independent of pulmonary pressure as evidenced from your slide. 
Um, no, I, I, I don't think it's as evidenced by that. I think, I think it's more that the body has got an ability to adapt to increased resistance up to a point before it suddenly fails. So I think I would suggest that the fact that a baby with apparently severe PPHN looks okay means that they just look okay at this point in time, that they may well uh, de they may well decompensate quite rapidly. Just as a, a, if a five-year-old child comes into your emergency department with sepsis, they might have a normal blood pressure at that point the blood pressure is the last thing to the last thing to drop. So if a child's maintaining its cardiac output in the face of PPHN, well, I'm delighted that it's maintaining its cardiac output, but it doesn't mean it's still going to be maintaining its cardiac output 10 minutes later. It might, it might just not have collapsed yet. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, next question is what, uh, what about the role of checking the response to increase in invasive blood pressure? after a slight hepatic compression as a marker of fluid status in neonics? I love that question. Thank you so much, Rohit. Um, it's, a, it's a question I get asked a lot. And um, I've certainly worked with a number of very experienced neonatal colleagues who think my passion for point-of-care ultrasound is entirely stupid because they feel very clear that they can assess fluid responsiveness by pressing on the liver. Um, I cannot. And the reason why I don't think I can do that reliably is that I think if you press on the child anywhere, there's a reasonable chance that they get a stress response to that. So I do not find that personally, I do not find that marker to be reliable because I don't know if their blood pressure goes up because they have a stress response from being handled versus I'm squeezing some blood out of their liver. I would also point out, whenever you look at these babies on ultrasound, they haven't got a great supply of blood sitting in their livers. There's not a big sump of blood in there that suddenly comes out. And lastly, I would argue that if you've got an ultrasound probe nearby, wouldn't you rather not press hard on a child's liver and just press gently over their liver and, and look for the filling? Um, so I, I, I hear that argument. I understand that other people can do that, um, but I'd, ra I'd rather do an ultrasound, thanks very much. I also, one of, the, one of the key things for me with the ultrasound is that again, I'm not disputing in these babies that they need fluid resuscitation. And I don't think anybody is disputing that a baby with sepsis needs fluid resuscitation. What I'm talking about is just how aggressive should one be and how quickly can one reassess that and go back and decide whether one needs to give yet more fluid? I don't believe pressing over a liver does that. So be more gentle. Uh, use, use the probe rather than your hand to press. I, I would much rather, if it was my baby, I would much rather somebody looked at the filling and cardiac output with a probe for two minutes than pressed hard on my child's liver and, and see if I got a, a surge in blood pressure. Thank you. So next question from Kanchana. How fast do you give the bolus of 10 ml per kilo to a baby with cautious fluid resuscitation? Uh, 30 to 60 minutes. I think that's a reasonable time frame. If you're not, if you really don't think the child is collapsing, 30 to 60 minutes for 10 mils per kilo and then reassess. Is there, is there any role of giving fluids at the time of birth, looking at card ABT suggesting chronic intrauterine hypoxia? Uh, great question. Thank you. Um, in my opinion, it depends entirely on whether you think that that intrauterine chronic hypoxia is associated with a blood loss from the baby. If there is blood loss from the baby, then yes. If there is not blood loss from the baby, I think no. So again, history, history is really vital to that. If there is a clear-cut abruption and you think the child has um, lost volume, then they need to be fluid resuscitated. If you think the child has had a chronic fetal maternal hemorrhage, then they probably don't need to be volume resuscitated, but they probably do need to have their crit rapidly increased. If you think the child has had something other than um, blood loss, 
then I think one needs to be very wary of giving too much fluid because cerebral edema is one of your key concerns in that first six or 12 hours, and you don't want to worsen that. One of the things that I currently find very hard to understand is that there, a, a child with a partial cord obstruction will end up having blockage of flow in, in the arterial side, sorry, blockage of flow on the venous side, not so much blockage of flow in the arterial side and therefore the placenta will fill up with blood. So this, these, a child with a partial, partial cord obstruction might have lost 20, 40, even 60 mils per kilo of blood into the placenta. I just find it very hard to know when that has happened or not happened. But again, it's, it's about defining so I, there's, there's no answer to the question, should you give fluid resuscitation in the presence of hypoxia? One has, to, one has to clarify what the cause of said hypoxia was and then target our resuscitation if it's a cause that's associated with loss of circulating volume. I request Dr. Jai Krishnan to take up further question. Thank you. Mm. So the next question is, um, so is there a role for fresh frozen plasma in fluid resuscitation? I think almost never. Um, I don't at all believe that we should be using albumin or FFP as volume resuscitation. Um, the, the data on albumin at least is very clear and there's every reason that FFP should follow the same pattern. So as yeah. fluid resuscitation, no. If you feel that there has been a loss of blood and therefore a loss of clotting factors, so a large a placental abruption that has been associated with fetal blood loss, then yes, I think you might need to replace some of your factors, but that's a different argument than for fluid resuscitation. Thank you. Um, so Ms. Maria has uh, mentioned that she wants to do a course on functional eco under your coordination. So probably she can uh, type it directly to you. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm delighted to take emails about that. There's a, there's a huge problem with our ability to provide this training at this point. Um, it's, an, it's an international problem. Um, there are, however, thankfully, a great number of uh, online resources that help with this and a great number of um, uh, an increasing number of courses. Um, I would direct everybody to three or four different websites. The POCUS Neo website is excellent. I obviously like my NICU POCUS website. Uh, the TNE website is excellent. Um, still, I think arguably the single best training resource for neonatal echocardiography is Nick Evans uh, Functional Echocardiography for the Neonatologist, which is now available as a software download for 25 Australian dollars. Um, but if you put that on one of your work computers, um, that's a pretty low cost for, for a truly exceptional, um, exceptional training program. And Dr. Evans uses all the funds from that to support their own hemodynamic research. Um, if I could do, if I would suggest people do one thing, it would be to download Dr. Evans, uh, functional echo program. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Rohit has asked, would you still consider fluid in a situation of sepsis with full IVC? Uh, so it's very hard to know when you get to the top of your Frank Starling curve. If I don't think I'm at the top of my Frank Starling curve, I'm going to consider that. And a key question for that is that if you think the IVC is full, but the heart is empty, then absolutely I'm gonna give fluids because it's an intracardiac filling problem. But if your left atrium looks full and your left ventricle looks full, I agree that's poor contractility. So no, at that point, I'm, I'm not gonna be aggressive with my fluids. I might give 10 per kilo and see if I think look, things look better. Um, but in a child who's that far along with, if that's truly sepsis at that point, that that child's in trouble. And yes, I would be wanting to give an inotrope or presser. And that in itself is a very difficult decision to make. Again, one has to try and break this into preload, contractility and afterload, and try and, and, try and define um, what, what you're trying to achieve with that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so do you recommend correcting acidosis by bicarb for better cardiac functions and improve uh, 
I know drop efficacy. That's a common um, <laughs> I I don't, but mm. I fully acknowledge that others do. My argument for not doing this, I think, is threefold. In the newborn baby, there's pretty good echo evidence that a pH as low as 7.0 doesn't intrinsically change your myocardial contractility. So if the pH is above seven, I'm not sure that um, getting it higher does anything. Secondly, I think it's primarily treating the symptom rather than the cause. The acidosis is coming from poor tissue perfusion. So let's fix the perfusion rather than just the pH. Um, and I can't pretend to fully understand, but if you read um, a wonderful review um, called Sodium Bicarbonate, an Utterly Baseless Therapy, I'm currently blanking on the author's name, uh, apologies to her. There's, there is decent evidence that rapidly changing the extracellular um, bicarbonate level gives you a opposite effect on the intracellular level and that giving a rapid bicarb treatment can actually worsen your intramyocardial pH and worsen function. So I do not do that, but my cardiac ICU and PICU colleagues absolutely do. So I can't be sure which is right or wrong, but my answer is no. Okay. Uh, somebody has asked, would you use albumin as volume expander? Or I, I think obviously you have already answered that. I, no? I think I have answered that. I think, I think, I think we now have our final answers on that. Albumin is a no. If you're in acute phase of sepsis, you've got capillary leak. That albumin is going to leak out of your vasculature at pretty much the same speed as your normal saline. And there's this notional argument, at least, that once your capillary leak improves and your walls of your capillaries are more firm, it's harder then for your albumin to come back into your circulating compartment. I'm not sure that that's the case. That doesn't sit right to me as being biologically plausible, but there's certainly plenty of evidence that says it's no better than a crystalloid. So let's just give saline and then ringers. So that again answers the next question automatically that Will you get a pulmonary edema when albumin is used? Uh, yes, so you may have. I, no. I think you get. I think you get edema everywhere whenever anything mm. is used, and I'm not mm. sure that's the fluids that we give. I suspect a lot of that is the capillary leak from the intrinsic problem in the baby's circulation. So I'm not sure that the babies get edematous because of the fluid we give them. I think they get edematous because they're maldistributing their fluid, and if we don't correct that if we don't top them up on that then they have poor intra circulating volume so i think we are forced to aggressively fluid resuscitate <clears throat> these babies um and i i continue to preach that edema is tomorrow's problem for the baby that i think is going to die today i'm going to keep giving them volume until i think they've got adequate tissue perfusion and I might be wrong about that. I, to I might be wrong about everything I've talked about today. There isn't good enough data for any of the things that we're talking about. But I strongly believe in a baby with sepsis that our tendency in the NICU is to under fluid resuscitate. So the next question is by Kiran, Kiran More from Qatar. So he said that we can use, we use stroke volume variations on ICON for fluid responsiveness. But we always couple it with echo as it does, as it don't always correlate. So in fact, yeah. uh, stroke I, volume variation on invasive arterial trace may be useful as a bedside tool. What is your experience on that? Yeah, so I, I think that the um, I think that the variability on any of those parameters is likely to be really strong. The my my experience with the icon. Um, was that when I tried to correlate it to actual cardiac output, that it was not very strongly coordinated, uh, not very strongly associated. So I'm a bit wary about the ICON. The, the published data on ICON says it's accurate to plus or minus 500 mils per minute of cardiac output. Well, that's the entire cardiac output. So that, that's a non that's a non reassuring finding. I haven't personally seen the data on um, 
stroke variability from ICON, but I apologize if I've missed that and if that has been published. Um, but it's certainly one of the metrics that I think could be extremely useful. I think a high level of variability beat to beat in any of these measures is likely to suggest inadequate preload. Thank you. Uh, Chandra, you have a few questions with you, I suppose. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, this question is from Victor. If a baby with HFOV high map IVC variability is useful for evaluating polemic state, how can I be sure about my exam? In a baby who is on high frequency oscillatory ventilation with high map, IVC variability, is, is it useful for evaluating the volumic state? How can I be sure about my exam? Excellent question, thank you. So it depends on whether the baby is trying to breathe spontaneously on top of the HFOV. If, you got, if you're on HFOV at 10 or so hertz, that's too rapid a pattern to see any collapsibility in your IVC. And your, IV, your IVC may well be full because you've got a high intrathoracic pressure that is relentless. There is no expiration phase where blood can get into the heart. So on, on the oscillator, your IVC looks very full. But if your heart looks empty on ultrasound and if, you're, and if your ejection fraction is low on ultrasound, then that tells you I think compellingly that you still need fluid resuscitation. Um, so I think you just have to switch your, I think you just have to switch your metrics that you're gonna wanna use your intracardiac filling and your cardiac output and injection time, not your, not your variability with respiration, unless the child is on the oscillator and also still trying to breathe strongly spontaneously. Thank you. So. Next uh, uh, question is from Dr. Ramakrishnan. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gross. Very nice lecture. What's your experience on parameters like flow time corrected FTC, SVV, stroke volume variation, and TFC, thoracic fluid content, obtained from electrical cardiometry, ICON, to guide fluid management? Is there any work going on in your unit? Um, I have to be honest, I am not. I am not currently working on those. Um, I can only assume that there are a lot of centers working on those, but I haven't, I haven't seen that. If anybody would like to email me individually, uh, I would love to hear about that. I know that the team in Toronto are putting together a hemodynamics consortium globally which is intended to um, try and make sure that people globally are coordinated and who is looking at what, so that we're not duplicating effort. And I don't think any of us should be competing with each other for uh, research projects. I think we should be collaborating with, the, with each other for those research projects. I, the, the problem with doing these studies for acute sepsis is the babies are very hard to predict. Your window of um, recruitment is very narrow. So what I encourage people to do wherever possible is to have their um, bedside vital signs backed up somewhere on some kind of monitor or storage device. Uh, Bedmaster, sick bay are both quite expensive solutions to this, but they are excellent. There are a bunch of other ways of, of being able to go back and store your vital sign data. And I strongly encourage anybody that's got an interest in looking at this to put any clinical monitoring on the baby that they think might be helpful. And then to piece together their understanding about this by going back in children and, and, and looking at these but I think doing a study where we randomize kids to a different fluid resuscitation approach based on their icon thoracic impedance might be quite challenging. Thank you. Is there a way to measure systemic vascular resistance on echo? Um, 
yes, it's very straightforward. Um, pressure equals flow time resistance. Therefore, uh, resistance is flow divided by pressure. So if you measure your true cardiac output reliably enough, and if you have a true measure of pressure, then you know your resistance. It is as simple as that. The problem is that our measures that we go into that are quite variable. But if we could measure our left ventricular output with 100% reliability and our blood pressure with 100% reliability, there's your metric of, of peripheral vascular resistance. My, the problem I think comes with that is that I'm not sure that we yet know how to think of things in terms of that vascular resistance because I don't necessarily know whether said vascular resistance being low or high is good or bad. Again, I think it depends on all of the aspects of our neonatal circulation. So what I would, what I do in practice every day is I look at the preload, the contractility, the afterload, and if present, the fetal shunt patterns, and try and work out whether I'm trying to push each one of those things up or down. And I try and use a measure to do each one of those things. So if I want more preload, that's more volume. If I want more contractility, then that's normally milrinone or perhaps dobutamine and definitely hydrocortisone. If I want to increase my afterload, and that is the case sometimes in sepsis that you've lost your perfusion pressure, then I need to give a vasopressor. If I think there's too much afterload, then I need to give a vasodilator, again, most likely dobutamine or milrinone. And if there's a fetal shunt there, 99 times out of 100, I'm going to ignore the PDA. But if I think the PDA is stealing too much of the blood away, maybe I want to either try and close the PDA or at least change my PVR to stop so much shunt going through the PDA. Thank you. I would like to also uh, mention that, I mean, uh, the systemic vascular resistance, I think, would, would uh, keep varying from... Uh, the heart to the peripheral vascular bed, right? I mean, is it uh, measuring at one at one point, uh, maybe at the aortic level, may not reflect what is there uh, in the peripheral vascular bed? Is it right? Uh, sorry, again, it was that you were a little faint. Could I ask you just to to repeat that for me? So measuring systemic vascular resistance at one point, maybe like, you know, uh, a flow by looking at the flow and blood pressure at the level of aorta may, may not reflect systemic vascular resistance in the peripheral vascular bit, right? Uh, yes, I think that I think that's absolutely fair. And but for I think for most of our babies with structurally normal hearts and circulations on most of our NICU babies do, then I think we know that the prime driver of our blood pressure is the arteriolar bed. But absolutely, we, we are, the oxygen delivery happens at the capillary bed. So after that bed, so there are definitely times where we want to manipulate that resistance up and down. Thank you. Thank you so much. There are a couple of questions about the role of perfusion index uh, as a marker for uh, looking at the perfusion of the baby. Perfusion index from pulse oximeter. Uh, I think that I think that technology is getting better and better. Um, I personally have not found that I can use it. I, I know certainly all the Massimo uh, SATs monitors now share their perfusion index um, data routinely. I have not personally found that I am acting on that number, but it might just be that I'm not paying enough attention to that number. So again, I think if, if others have got more um, experience of that, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to suggest, because I'm but one person trying to, to, you know, to cover a vast range of technologies. If anybody would like to email me directly with their experience or the organizers with their experience, I would love to share that to make sure that we're giving the most current data. 
So there are a lot more uh, questions in the QA box. Uh, I would like to know like how many of them would you be you know interested and do you have uh, time to take them? I've um, got all day, so I just worry about other people, but I'm guessing everybody else can just drop off the call whenever they don't want to be here anymore. Sure, thank you. Uh, so how do you interpret PI index, normal values? Oh, there are normal values published. Um, my, again, in the, in the real world situation, I do not measure the tie index. Um, I just look to see if the ejection time is clearly too short, as I put in that right ventricular output. Um, but myocardial performance index or tie index, it's, it's well published. Um, normative values are available. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have them off the top of my head. So I request Dr. Jay Krishnan to take over. So, Professor Gross, um, um, there are lot many concerns and questions regarding your um, aggressive fluid therapy. So, I'll, I'll, there are almost five six queries regarding that. I'll uh, mention all of them, and you can answer uh, simultaneously for one of for them. So, the one person has asked: Is there any information regarding IVH in babies uh, aggressively resuscitated with more than sixty ml per kg of volume? Uh, another one has also asked that, um, is it good to give 40 to 60 ml per kg of fluid in extreme preterm baby? The third one also asked that in perinatal asphyxia, shouldn't we be guided guarded in our fluid resuscitation? And then uh, Dr. Anamika has asked the uh, amount of the, the, how much duration uh, you should take to give a bolus 30 or 60 minutes. And then um, one person has asked, uh, isn't it right that excess fluid will lead to um, increased frequency of bronchopulmonary dysplasia? And then um, Dr. Gorov has asked that um, classically we are taught to give only one bolus and that too as 10 ml per kg and that too over 30 to 60 minutes. So this is actually, <laughs> I think, um, concerning people regarding the um, um, high fluid. So yeah. you can uh, answer all of them. I, I think those are yeah. I think those are all really good points. And mm. honestly, it's a it's a key reason why I I say yes every time I get an opportunity to talk about this to such a to such a, a large audience and a and a committed audience. I feel very clearly that we need to separate out children who have got decreased filling, who've got decreased preload, and children who do not. And the children that have decreased preload, as I say, I think are the babies that have got sepsis with third spacing, either infection or NEC, but they've got a, a septic syndrome. And that those children have lost easily half of their circulating volume from that sepsis. And I'm giving 40 to 60 mils per kilo to try and get their circulations back up to normal. I'm not trying to overfill their circulations. So I don't think you would be asking that question if you saw a baby lose half of their circulating blood volume. I don't think anybody would say, is it safe to give this baby 40 to 60 mils per kilo to replace that? Of course it is. You're replacing what was <clears throat> meant to be there. I totally accept that children with a neurologic insult are at risk from getting too much volume. But again, I think you'll find if you take your history and you do your examination and use your bedside measures, you'll tend to find that those children do not fall into the category that I'm saying needs aggressive fluid resuscitation. They would require cautious fluid resuscitation, 10 mils per kilo over 30 to 60 minutes and reassess and see if it's made a difference. So I absolutely agree. One of our jobs is to try and target, to individualize our aggressive fluid resuscitation to the babies that need aggressive and to ease off doing fluid resuscitation to the babies that don't need it. So again, I'm sorry that there, there, isn't, a, there isn't a one word answer to this question. We have to try and get as much data on each individual baby as we can and target our interventions to that. I am more concerned about not adequately resuscitating a very preterm baby who clearly has an underfilled circulation my experience in the last 20 years has been as neonatologists, we are much more likely to under resuscitate a 25 week with NEC than we are to over resuscitate it. 
Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> there are two or three questions which uh, um, the the query uh, the people are concerned regarding uh, shock and PDA. So should you give them bolus or you should restrict the fluid? So shock in the presence of PDA. Um. So I deliberately choose to have a somewhat extreme view to the PDA, which is that we should ignore it. We should rename it the red herring vessel, the RHV, and just forget about it and never do another study and never do another treatment for it. <laughs> I don't quite believe that. There are occasions when I actually think we should treat it, but very, very few of them, once or twice a year in my, in my hands. What the PDA does do is make it harder for us to interpret what our cardiac output is doing and what our cardiac filling is doing. But I don't believe that we should fluid resuscitate in the fluid restrict in the presence of a PDA. I don't think it makes any difference. I don't think the PDA makes any difference to your risk of chronic lung disease or IVH anyway. And if I think a baby has sepsis and a PDA, I'm not going to be affected by the PDA. I'm going to give them just as much fluid as I would do where they did they not have a PDA. But I'm definitely an outlier in that. If you ask a hundred neonatologists that question, I am the hundredth at the extreme of that saying absolutely just ignore the PDA. It's total nonsense. Yeah. And uh, Kiran has asked, what is the best time to start hydroport in uh, shock, newborn shock? I feel that we should start the hydrocortisone at the same time as we make a decision to give our pressors and at the same time as we make a decision to give packed cells for oxygen carrying capacity. And I tend to make those three decisions all at the same time, at the time point that I've given my first two boluses and I'm still worried about the baby. Uh, Christy Waterberg's meta-analysis of hydrocortisone in the preterm baby, I find very compelling. It suggests that actually across all micropremies, we should probably be giving them all 0.5 milligrams per kilo of hydrocortisone in the newborn period. And I have no concerns about giving one milligram per kilo of hydrocortisone to any baby that looks sick. Um, I think there is nothing that says that it's bad for your um, neurodevelopment. There's everything that says it's good for your hemodynamic function. I do believe it, that it increases your risk of spontaneous intestinal perforation if you give it related to indomethacin or ibuprofen. But of course, I've already ignored the PDA, so I've never given indomethacin or ibuprofen anyway, because the PDA is a total distraction from what we should actually be worried about. So I give hydrocortisone very early to these babies. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Raghavindra Rao have asked, what is the ch uh, fluid choice in neonatal diarrhea? And uh, the second question by him only is, do you use Ringa? If so, in what condition? So I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to the question about neonatal diarrhea because it's, it's simply never the presenting symptom in the patient population that I look after. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't give an answer to that, but I, I guess I'm going to say whatever the situation, one needs data to tailor your treatment. So I'm going to give some fluid resuscitation and I start with saline because it's what's there. But after that, I'm going to want to follow my electrolytes and try and target whatever fluid I need to give to whatever I see on their electrolytes. Yeah, thank you. And then there are multiple questions regarding the same. I mean, people are asking the same uh, answer. So is there any sequence of presses or inotropes? What is the uh, pressure or inotrope of choice initially? And then uh, later on, which one is better? Dopa, dobuta, epinephrine or norepinephrine? And uh, um, so, so, I, so think can you the, yes, I think sorry. the best answer to that is still from one of Istvan Seri's review articles from, I'm going to say 1993. Um, he has a wonderful uh, review article on that. Uh, my own review article with David Cox, which talks about which inotrope for which baby, um, I think is the title from 2016, 2017, uh, tries to go into this. Again, the answer to your question is that there isn't one that is better than the other. They have differences in what they do. So one needs to assess the child's physiology mm -hmm. and then apply your principles. Preload, contractility, and afterload. So if we think of this as being a spectrum of how much activity they have, 
at this far end of the spectrum over here, we have medications that tend to be inotropes while being vasodilators. And we have medications at this end that tend to be inotropes while being vasopressors. And the question is, do you want an inotrope that's a vasodilator to decrease your afterload? So a child with a structural cardiac lesion with too much peripheral vascular resistance, they need to be on milrinone or dobutamine to give you inotropy and vasodilatation. In contrast, a child in septic shock who's got far too little afterload needs to be on an inotrope and a vasopressor to maintain your perfusion pressure. The most pressive one being norepinephrine and then epinephrine and dopa are probably roughly the same as each other in the middle. So if I'm not sure, I'll give dopa or epi. If I'm sure I want to press her, I'll give norepi. If I'm sure I want to delay her, I'll give milrinone. Yeah, thank you. And then there are two, three questions regarding the different um, um, indicators or indices which can be utilized. So one is pulse satility index and its significance. Another is NIRS and its significance. Another is Length variability index, and then, um, then there is a hepatic vein Doppler assessment. So there are three and four questions regarding these different so indicators. How can my, it be? To my understanding, uh, pulse fertility index and plath variability index are essentially measuring the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that your pulse ox works by looking at your total your total level of signal from your bed and you've got some venous and you've got some capillary and then you've got signal from your arterial component and the amount of signal that is pulsatile is just telling you how much new blood is getting into your fingertip <clears throat> with each pulse and the more of the more of your signal that is made up by that variable component the more perfusion you theoretically have. I do, I've not find, I've not found personally that number to be useful, but I would love to, it seems like it should be useful, but I'm, I've not personally got to the point of, of using it. NEARS is a whole two or three talks on their own. And um, we certainly are using NEARS more and more. My own unit certainly uses NEARS as routine in all of our cardiac patients and we're kind of using it on some of our NICU patients, but it's quite variable in the numbers that you get. It's very dependent on your um, sensor position. With the standard Invos two channel nears, if you put it on one side of a child's forehead, take it off and put it back on, you can get a number that's 15% higher or 15% lower. That's the, that's the proven repeatability of the technique. And that's the whole ball game in terms of the, your variability in the patient population. So I think NEARS needs to be better um, before we can really use it. NEARS, of course, does not have the time constant to be able to do a beat to beat variability. So it is intrinsically a static measure, not a dynamic measure. So I would much rather look at the beat to beat variability on another metric like pulsatility index than to think that NEARS is, is really giving me much additional information. Uh, hepatic vein echo, I think that's really interesting. I have not, I've never thought of that. So I need to have a think about that. If somebody else has some experience again, I'd love to hear it and, and share it and make sure it's being published and, and peer reviewed. The problem I think with any of these measures is that once we're looking at these smaller blood vessels, it becomes impossible to reliably measure the diameter of the vessel. So then you're just looking at the flow rate within the vessel. And I'm not sure that the hepatic vein should perform any better than the IVC, which is a bigger blood vessel with more flow in it. Thank you. And one, just one more question that in a preterm baby who isn't shocked, so his blood pressure and perfusion is maintained, but he is having metabolic acidosis, his bicarbs are low. So is there any role for any fluid bolus? That's a... uh, definitely not. Um, we again need to measure our, uh, we need to work out what the cause is and our preterm babies, classically, the reason why they've got uh, metabolic acidosis is that we've gotten behind with our bicarbonate replacement as the child became polyuric on day two, three, four of life. <coughs> and they're wasting a lot of bicarbonate out of their kidneys, normally we've just got behind on that. 
So an acetate infusion or adding more acetate to your TPN seems like the way to do that. Only if you think inadequate tissue perfusion is the cause of your acidosis, should you be giving fluid resuscitation. We do not have acetate preparation for TPN in India. So can we use a strong or a weak bicarb solution? Uh, yeah, you can have which... bicarb. You know, acetate is bicarb. It turns into bicarb in one pass through the liver. So I don't, I, an, an infusion is very different from a bolus for me. So if your goal is to maintain homeostasis in your baby, <clears throat> the answer to that is always going to be yes. If this baby's lost lots of bicarb, through its kidneys, then I want to give it bicarb back. But what I don't want to do is give it 20 per kilo of 4.2% sodium bicarbonate over 30 minutes. That's producing a rapid, a rapid shift and a rapid change. I only want to rapidly do something if I'm getting it back to normal from an acute loss. If a baby's lost bicarb through their kidneys over the previous 48 hours, then I, got, I want to give them a bicarb infusion over 24 hours and gradually replace that to get that those losses back up but i certainly don't want to give 20 per kilo over 20 minutes yeah thank you um, Chandrasek, can you summarize please the rest of the question i think we are uh, quite late in our session yeah, yeah. Uh, so you. there are some questions asking for any normative data on ic size is there any nomogram available i mean because or is it just a relative, uh, you know, uh, indicator you look at? Yeah, there, there is data out on that, actually. Um, and there's data using that to correlate to central venous pressure. Um, I can't, if you give me a second, I might be able to pull the paper up while we are talking. Um, so give me a second, ask me something else. Okay, so uh, next question is about uh, uh, like uh, you know what 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 the equipment at the bedside is available. I mean, this is my own question to uh, measure this uh, pulse pressure variability. I mean, is it widely available uh, all over, uh, or I mean, you have uh, I mean kind of. Uh, uh, customized your uh, um, uh, echo or bedside uh, pulse oximeters to measure no, I, mean, I think index. so for an invasive for an invasive blood pressure mm. i think all of the current vendors now have an option for pulse pressure variability within that monitor it's okay. just that in every unit I've worked in, it's just not set up because we don't quite know what to do with that metric. So they don't display that metric. Uh, but if you call your biomed person or if you download the instructions from the internet, you may well be able to find a way of, of, of having the machine calculate that for you. It's just, it's just mathematics. It's nothing more than that. So if you've got an invasive arterial line that's measuring waveform, you can get your pulse pressure variability from that. The cutoff, the, the cutoff that the adults use is 12%. If you've got more than a 12% beat to beat variability in your pulse pressure, then that suggests that you're on low preloader and you should give some volume. I haven't seen the number proven in babies. And I, as I mentioned before, it's complicated by babies who've got intrinsic respiratory effort where that might cloud that picture. Um, but Philips, GE, and Others, you should always be able to get that on your on your standard bedside monitor. Uh, the best data I've seen on normative ranges is a paper by Hruda, H R U D A, that is published in the American Journal of Perinatology back in two thousand and three. They were looking at comparing IVC size to CVP, and in doing so, they showed very little relation between the two, but as part of that, they also showed the normal ranges of IVC diameter, which was a mean of three and three and a half millimeters at max and one and a half millimeters in min. So, uh, so ba our babies have intrinsically quite a lot of collapsibility anyway. For me, what I use in reality is, is there a time point in which the IVC looks like it's completely closed? It should never be completely closed. But if in a baby where it's completely closed, I use that to say, okay, that kid needs volume. 
Thank you. So, is there any cutoff for short ejection time in functional echo? How many milliseconds? Uh, let me see if I can just get the same paper for Tay index. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the number off the top of my head. Um, it's a very short period of time. It's probably like 0.15, um, but I don't have... Sorry, ask me another and I'll pull up the answer to that question. I'm gonna answer the, the question after each time until, <laughs> until we get to the end. So the next question is from Dr. Kiran from Qatar. Um, so what he says is uh, septic shock uh, should be treated like septic shock with aggressive fluid resuscitation, but should echo always precede this as there may be septic shock mimicking cardiac dysfunction, which may get worse with aggressive fluids. How safe is empiric aggressive fluid therapy? Excellent question. So the cardiac filling measures on ultrasound I think sort that question out for you. If you have got intrinsically impaired myocardial performance, you have got decreased ejection, and therefore there is a backlog of fluid before that, and you will have a dilated atria and a dilated IVC. And I totally agree. If you put the probe on the chest and there appears to be a dilated IVC and a dilated heart and poor contractility, I do not want to aggressively fluid resuscitate. Totally agree. But I think the vast majority of babies, at least in my NICU, the, the, the kids that die in my NICU are, <clears throat> are ex-prem 23, 24, 25 weekers who get sepsis or NEC. Those babies almost certainly don't have an intrinsic myocardial pathology 95 times out of 100, they've got sepsis or NEC and they need fluids. But the, the ultrasound at the bed, bedside is, I find, invaluable in distinguishing between those two pathologies. Yeah, with that, I think we have uh, uh, completed uh, all the questions. Uh, thank you so much. I would uh, hand over the desk to Dr. Manoj. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Uh, well, this was a very uh, elaborate and uh, excellent session. Uh, as like all times, all of us who attended NeoHeart of last year uh, are aware that in all, like, you know, all hemodynamic uh, sessions, Professor Alan Groves is one of the star speakers. Very aggressive, very compelling. Uh, Professor Alan, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, spending your time with us today. Thank you, sir. That's a pleasure. Let me also thank both the moderators of today, Dr. Jay Krishan and Dr. Uh, Chandra Kumar, two good friends of mine. Thank you so much, sirs, for joining us today to moderate today's session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think <laughs> and finally, thank you all respected attendees who have joined us from 65 countries all around the world. Today is the 25th session in our series and we are truly honored to have you all with us. Kindly do also join us for our upcoming session on 8th April at the same time, 7.30 p.m. Indian time on uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia prevention and management uh, by one of the legends of evidence-based medicine, Professor Saul. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.